The weekly Industry Angel podcast hears from business leaders and entrepreneurs who share their stories and that all-important light bulb moment. This can inspire us all and maybe scratch that itch and kickstart that idea that keeps you awake at night. Welcome to episode five of the Industry Angel. I hope you're all well and you haven't been suffering too much with this cold and flu that everyone seems to have had. I hope you enjoyed the previous episodes. Thanks for all the feedback via the website, Facebook and connecting via LinkedIn. It's great and it it really helps shape the future shows. I hope you're also enjoying the mix of guests we've had. I'm sure you'll agree they've all been very different and I'm going to continue that theme going forward. Thanks for subscribing and reviewing the show in iTunes. The show in iTunes? The show in iTunes. It's really helped me secure some fantastic guests going forward. Some real rock stars in the industry, and I know you're going to enjoy them, but I can't say too much more. I did promise some quick shout outs this episode. So, Nico at Mega Motion, thanks for all your feedback regarding the duration of the show. Hopefully, around the 30 minute mark works for everyone. Stick your running shoes on maybe and you'll clock a few miles up before you know it. But I'm really mindful of people's commutes as well, so I'm going to stick to around 30. Please let us know how that works for you. Beck Hughes at House of Hughes really enjoyed Dinah Bennett. Dinah's episode was very popular, Beck, and I'm sure she'll be happy to hear your feedback. Hi to Anthony at Pit Stop Business Supplies. Anthony's finding the shows really motivational. I hope you guys are too. Derek Curtis at Cellular Solutions really enjoyed Daz Williams. Now, you're not alone, Derek. That's actually topping the episode downloads. And Maria thought Brad Burton was excellent and thinks being happy as a goal is massively overlooked. Well, yes, Brad's episode, again, was very popular. Uh, It took us a while to edit it, mind. (laughs) But I promise to do more shout-outs on the next episode. We must crack on. We've got a great guest this week. Okay, today's guest joins us from Denver. He's on Mountain Time, so he should be about seven hours behind us in Blighty. He's recently launched his book, Creating a Cash Cow in Kenya, detailing some of the incredible experiences he lived whilst he was the CEO of Kenyan microfinance company, Jihadi Kalimo. Welcome, Nat Robinson. Hi, Ian. How are you? Thank you. Hi, I'm good. Now, listen, you'll have to tell me the right pronounce, pronunciation of this. <laughs> yeah. Jihudi, Jih- it's, it's Jihudi Kalimo, yes. You're close. Jihudi all right. Well, yeah, thanks very much. And what does that mean, Nat? So in Swahili, Jehudi means effort or hard work, and Kalimo is agriculture. So it, it doesn't really mean anything, but it's uh, essentially hard work and agriculture, effort in agriculture. Ah, right. Well, th- thanks for that. Yeah, sure. uh, apologies for my awful pronunciation. Yeah, no problem. So, so li- listen, how's things over in Denver? You got much snow there? Uh, we did yesterday, but it's uh, it's a beautiful sunny day this morning. So it's uh, it's been a very mild uh, winter these last couple of weeks. Yeah, we, you know, we, we've had exactly the same. It's like a spring day today, the sun's shining. But um, in terms of sun, you, I mean, you must have spent, what, six or seven years out in Kenya? Yeah, I so. had, uh, I'm, I'm not used to the snow, so I've had a <laughs> perpetual summer for the last yeah, seven years in Kenya. <laughs> sure. Well, listen, I, I'm dying to understand, you know, about all the experiences over in Kenya. But I think before we start, do you want to give us a bit of a potted sort of backstory in terms of how you landed in Africa and what you did before that? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. And uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, it was, I guess a lot of things happened in life. This certainly wasn't planned. I had uh, signed up for an eight-month assignment to be in Kenya, and that somehow turned into six and a half years. Uh, so <laughs> it was certainly an adventure. But before that, I'd, I'd worked in um, in philanthropy. I worked for a foundation in, in the U.S. and, and community de- development, uh, and then went to business school and was um, involved in consulting and, and really liked this concept of where business uh, interacts with uh social work and social good and using the tools of business to uh, alleviate poverty. And I had come across um, some of the big names in microfinance like Mohammed Yunus and the founder of uh, Kiva. And when I was working in Washington, D.C. as a consultant, I came across this opportunity to uh, work in Kenya for eight months. And I loved travel. I had uh, studied abroad and uh, at university and, and traveled all over uh, the world. So I thought this was a wonderful opportunity to, um, to do that. And I was on an assignment with uh, the Grassroots Business Fund, which was part of the IFC and the World Bank uh, at the time, and was helping them essentially find new businesses, new social businesses to invest. And um, over those eight months, and 
as part of that uh, project, I was uh, put in touch with a group called uh, the KREP Group, which is a, a bank and nonprofit organization that uses microfinance and different tools um, within the microfinance to alleviate different types of social problems within Kenya. And I think that's how I was then uh, put in touch with um, a group that was providing loans to rural farmers. And I had never had any experience with agriculture or farmers in the past. And I uh, learned a lot quickly and, and really fell in love with the work, and that's what um, became Jehudi Kalimo, and it is a social business that provides loans to rural farmers to purchase dairy cows and irrigation equipment that helps generate income and also can act as collateral on these loans for these farmers. So it was a very powerful uh, business model that I uh, really enjoyed working with, and I helped scale that up to be uh, a company that was serving 20,000 farmers and 100. 75 staff throughout the, the country. Well, it, it doesn't sound like you took much convincing that to, to stay over in Kenya. You must have fell in love with the place. <laughs> well, certainly did at, at the weather. You know, it's a uh, year round <laughs> sun and <laughs> it's no humidity, no bugs. It was uh, really a great place to live. So I, I, I did love it. And certainly the, the Kenyans too are fantastic to work with. I mean, in, t in terms of the Kenyans, now obviously you, you're there to help and, and, and sort of help them take their um, innovation forward. Did they, did they take to you? You know, you, you're a foreigner there. You know, what was the kind of challenges you felt there in terms of trust? Then, yeah, definitely. And I think you know, coming in as a, a very tall uh, American, I, I stuck out quite <laughs> a bit there. Uh, but I, I found immediately the the um, you know hospitality and warmth was um, you know was, was wonderful by the Kenyans. Very welcomed in uh, to the culture. And what I was surprised is when I would go out and talk to these rural farmers, um, many of whom who didn't speak English, and uh, a lot of the times were. I was one of the first uh, foreigners for some of these children to be in these parts of the country. They took to me right away, and I was very quickly able to build trust and credibility with our clients and uh, discovered later that a lot of these farmers had been taken advantage of, um, usually by a lot of their fellow Kenyans. So by seeing a, a foreigner, by seeing an outsider, um, they, they seemed to, th to see somebody who, who cared more for them than... Um, and others, I was very, uh, you know, quickly able to build up some of that trust and credibility with uh, with the farmers, which was surprising. But it certainly helped in terms of running a business and, and starting a company out there. Sure. So, so when you started that, did did you feel like you had a plan, or was it just an ongoing sort of? Did it evolve organically across the <laughs> the time? Yeah. The the, uh, the the you know there was a sort of a, a business concept or an idea that KREP had, and they had been uh, experimenting and pilot testing, providing these loans, these asset-backed loans to farmers, and had a, a little bit of data, a little bit of a, a track record. Um, so when I came in, I was helping then this this sort of concept spin off from a nonprofit to become a for-profit and social business, and that required raising uh, about $5 million to get up to profitability. And I put together the business plan and, and the structure, and I uh, thought, oh, this will be easy, could take a few months to raise $5 million and, and quickly realized that that was, was quite difficult and took a, a long time um, because we, since we went from a nonprofit to a for-profit, we were no longer able to get the, uh, the donor money from, our, um, from the foundations and some of the traditional uh, grant uh, funders. And yet, at the same time, we weren't quite uh, you know, business ready or, or you know, attractive enough for some of these investors. Uh, so we were stuck in between this uh, this phase, and I think that was where we found a lot of our impact investors, in particular uh, Kiva, which is the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, online uh, lender where anyone around the world can give a loan of $25, uh, and we put up a profile of one of our clients, one of our farmers, and that's aggregated uh, over time, and we're able to raise money through that uh, through that that process, and I think that's what really helped us uh, get going. So there was there was certainly a business plan, but it didn't at all work out the way that uh, we had we had planned. It certainly took a lot longer than um, I think I had anticipated, but eventually got there. Sure, you, you touched on Kiva there. Um, so did you sort of all of your um, clients going forward? Did you always push them down the Kiva route? So yeah, you, you had a profile for each one, or did you just test it with that one chap? Or we were yeah, and, and um, you know early on we, uh, we were small enough that we were able to put a lot of our clients up on Kiva and sort of integrate this process of taking the pictures and the photos or the profiles and putting them on the Kiva website into our day to day lending process. But we were limited by Kiva of only doing about thirty percent of our portfolio. So we weren't oh, able to put all of our clients on there. So, but we we put a lot on. Yeah, 
it, it's amazing. I, I had a quick look earlier on because I know we you know we've, we've passed some emails back, and you did mention Kiev, and I love the concept. So, in terms of the people who um, who donate or, or, or essentially lend the money, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, is it a lot of over, is it a lot of US people who use that site, or is it it's, mainly global? It's pretty or? global. I think it's uh, probably around 70 percent US, and then the the rest from around the around the world. So it's it's fairly global. I'm going to have to get involved now. I love, I love the I love the concept of it. Do you get on there now? I, I do. Yep, I'm still a very active member of uh, Kiva. Was one of the um, I think when they first started get started get going in uh, 2004, 2003, 2004, I started giving loans. So they've uh, been around for a little while. But it's a fantastic organization. If you go onto Kiva, you can search uh, Juhudi Kilimo and then find our our clients and then provide a loan to the clients. So it's not a it's not a grant, it's not a donation. In fact, when those clients repay, when those farmers repay, you get that money back. And then you can relend it to another um, another farmer or somebody else in the world. Kiva.org, and it, it yes. sounds brilliant. I'm going to have to take a look. Oh, great. <laughs> so I'm really interested in terms of some of the um, innovation and entrepreneurship you've experienced over in Kenya. Is is that what the book's about, Nat? Are you sort of detailing some of the people and stories you've come across? Or? It, it is. And I think that I wrote the book to really help a lot of those other social entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs in general. I just feel the, the the suffering and pain that I went through. Um, it shouldn't have to be repeated by by others. Uh, if if uh, if I can be of any assistance, you know, of course there's enough. Uh, challenges and suffering in terms of running a, a business. But if I could uh, put some of these stories down, I thought that this may be a way of, of helping future entrepreneurs of, avoid some of the mistakes uh, that, that we made along the way. Because I certainly didn't have any clue of what I was doing in terms of raising money or uh, running a business. I had an idea. I'd read a lot of books and talked to a lot of people. But until you're really in it, um, it's hard to hard to really learn a lot of that experience. But what was really interesting to me was seeing the level of uh, the entrepreneurs in, in Kenya and just the, the energy, the excitement, the innovation that was happening both in the rural areas and within Nairobi. And uh, that was that was real inspirational to what we were doing in terms of just then providing the financing to, um, to help these entrepreneurs take their ideas and um, achieve their dreams. And in part of the, the book, I talked about a... Um, uh, in say, uh, a part called Jehudi Labs, or is a um, initiative that we set up within the company to help uh, local entrepreneurs access our farmers. So if somebody had an idea on a new type of feed for cows, or a different uh, mobile uh, mobile phone app that helped train uh, farmers, or another way that uh, helped farmers save money on low-cost uh, solar lights, we would provide those entrepreneurs uh, access to all of our farmers so they could test and experiment with their products or services with our farmers. And then through Kiva, we would fundraise and, and provide working capital loans for these entrepreneurs. So it was sort of an incubator within our business to help then spur new ideas, new innovation to not only help our, our business, but also help the, the farmers uh, throughout, throughout Kenya. And that was really fun to work with. And, and did the labs just come from, you know, sort of, it just happened? Or was it a plan? Or <laughs> yeah, no, there's, there's definitely a plan. And we're, we're certainly weren't the only ones to, to do this. I think it was, right. you know, Google Labs had one, but it was, uh, I was part of a group in California that brought a lot of organizations together uh, called the Mulago Foundation. And sort of through those um, sessions was able to talk to some other entrepreneurs who had been experimenting with their own internal labs. Uh, one of the other uh, big social enterprises in East Africa is One Acre Fund. And they had been starting this, this concept. And even if you look back at where we started as Jehudi, part of KREP, um, we were, Jehudi Kalima was part of a pilot program essentially within a lab within the, the KREP um, institution. So uh, this this model I had seen play out uh, several times before, and I, I just wanted to now structure it a little bit differently and, and try it ourselves. And so that's, that's kind of where it came from. So really by using your past experience back in the U.S. and kind of brought that with you. Mm-hmm. Yep, Definitely. Uh, good stuff. And was that part of your business plan? You know, when you were, when you said you you put the plan together? <laughs> no, not at all. And in fact, our, no. even our our investors weren't all that excited about it because they weren't quite sure how this lab makes money. It seems like there was a lot of okay. resources going into it and not a real guarantee that um, there'd be value created uh, out of it. So I actually had to fundraise uh, separately for this initiative from some uh, through some grants and through some other uh, donors to, to get it started. Uh, so this was a completely separate thing that we, um, that we set up later. You mentioned earlier that you went from a not-for-profit to a profit. What was the driver behind that? It, that was, uh, I think, really from the, the experience that our, the founding organization 
organization KREP had in terms of running a nonprofit, that the grants world and the donor world is very inconsistent and it's difficult to, to really ensure long-term uh, sustainability of any operations um, because of that nature of that capital, whereas a, a for-profit company, you're able to access the, the capital markets and, and almost an unlimited source of, uh, of capital if you can keep things going. So the ability to scale and to grow, I, th I think we believe was much more, um, uh, was much greater in terms with the, uh, the for-profit model. So I think our our mistake was we went from the nonprofit to the for-profit a little bit too quickly. Uh, we didn't think about lining up a lot of that funding first before switching and leaving the, the grant world and going into the for-profit. So we're sort of stuck in that that valley before we could um, get over there. And that's what where Kiva kind of helped come in early and, and bridge that gap. Sure. And how many employees was there, Nat? When I started or when I left? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, you know, from, from start to finish. Yeah, we were probably, I think, 15 or 16 when we started. And uh, when I when I left, we were 175, uh, mostly all Kenyans. I think that was something that I really uh, believed in, was building a lot of our, our local uh, talent and our uh, our management. Um, so once I transitioned out, we, we brought in a, a fantastic Kenyan uh, CEO to take my take my role. So we were uh, started with, uh, I think, four or five offices and, and finished with 20 offices and 175 staff and a little over 20,000 clients. Wow. What a legacy. How, how do you feel about that? It, it, it was fun. You miss if it? you if you read the, the, the book, you'll see it wasn't all uh, uh, <laughs> it was incredibly <laughs> it was difficult. Fun. Some of the, the challenges and the drama that we had to uh, to, to deal with to get there um, it was was certainly a uh, <laughs> was wasn't easy. You know, as I've, I've looked at some of the, the reviews on Amazon, and you, you're blasting reviews, and you're getting five out of five or whatever <laughs> it is. But it's amazing because I think the people who are reading the book, that's you know, they really say, "Look, read this book because you won't go through some of the pitfalls that Nat did. <laughs> it's all there for you. You'll learn from it, and hopefully not not sort of you know go through the same pitfalls and mistakes. Is that is that really why you did the book? Yeah, that's it. And and I you know I hope that it's also entertaining for <laughs> for everybody else or anyone interested in travel in Kenya because I the way I set it up is I would would break up some of the business stories with some of my personal uh, stories and little adventures throughout Kenya and um, in Africa just to, to keep it entertaining so it's not all just uh, the business the dreary business <laughs> story and, and that experience but uh, that was I think the the start of it was I just wanted to, to help other entrepreneurs but also get this story out there because I feel like it's um, for such a small relatively small institution we, we did go through a lot of uh, a lot of drama <laughs> It's funny. I, I think the the humor um, has been mentioned on the reviews, and I'm sure the last review is something like "Young American guy stumbles his way through life." <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's a pretty pretty good uh, <laughs> synopsis. <laughs> so I'm really intrigued. You've mentioned adventures, and you've mentioned some of the entrepreneurs you've met. I need some stories, Nat. Oh sure, <laughs> just just in general. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just you know, obviously you, you you must have met some amazing people who are who are doing something, you know, really innovative and you know breaking the mold in in terms of agriculture and and some of the farmers you've met. Yeah, and, and that's what I I loved is is getting out of Nairobi and traveling to the. Um, to, the, to our offices and to our farms and meeting with some of our our clients who are, are facing, I think, very difficult um, conditions. You know, they're, they're essentially a population within Kenya that's been excluded from a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the growth and a lot of the development that the country's faced in the last uh, 10 years because of infrastructure, because of corruption, because of there's a lot of reasons um, behind it, but they're, they're still, um, you know, they're still surviving and, and doing well and subsisting on their farms and to be able to come in and, and provide the is financing for a for a cow and for a lot of these farmers it's their first um, financial service first loan first opportunity to um, to buy a high yield uh, dairy cow and so you have somebody who's making you know a few dollars a day and then suddenly now they've they've financed this uh, this cow and we have plenty of farmers who've been able to to do this um, doubling and tripling their income then from the milk uh, from that cow so they're able to then use the the milk sales to repay that loan after uh, 12 months and, and also during that time the cow is producing and calves, and uh, once the loan is done, which usually takes about 12 to 14 months, uh, that farmer then owns the owns that cow, and um, they can continue to generate income from the the milk sales. And I think that's 
uh, very empowering from the farmer's point of view because they can see their uh, their work that they've increased their their asset base, their their wealth base. They're now generating um, a new source of income, which they can then use to pay for their children to go to school or pay for um, any of their healthcare needs or reinvest back into their farm and get into um, uh, horticulture. We have a, a fantastic. A farmer out in western Kenya who, after his first couple of cow loans, got into tomato uh, farming and and built a greenhouse. And then from that uh, greenhouse was able to grow uh, tomatoes and sell those in the local market and has um, become one of the larger uh, suppliers of this produce in the in the region and he started literally from from nothing he had a small plot of land that he was uh, irrigating um, and it's really a, a inspirational story for him and then also the rest of the the farmers in the region they say well how did how did this happen how did you go from this guy to now uh, this guy and um, they say well it's you know this Jehudi Kalimo company came in and was able to take a risk and, and finance me because a lot of the banks and microfinance institutions do not want to go anywhere near a rural small-scale farm Farmer in agriculture because of all the risks and all the challenges of working um, uh, working out there, but we are able to to do that and take this risk. And if I think that the nice part is on the downside, if for whatever reason the farmer can't pay their loan, we can then just go and repossess the cow, and we at least leave the farmer in the same position they were before they took the loan. So we don't put them more into uh, debt, which a lot of the microfinance institutions and banks uh, do. And, and there's a great secondary market for the cows, so we're, we're pretty, you know, it's easy for us to then resell those to the to the community. Sure. So in terms of scaling up Jehudi Kalimo, it sounds like it was word of mouth, really. Sort of one farmer would say another farmer, you need to get on this. You need to buy more land, get more crops, and these are the guys that will help. Absolutely. Yep. It was, and and they're that they're the best um, marketers for us because a lot of the farmers, there's still a fair amount of distrust from institutions from Nairobi. And financial institutions. So, having a fellow farmer, somebody who's been in your position before, tell you that this is a good thing to do um, was it was very powerful for us. Yep. You, you must have a fantastic photo album, though, not yeah. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Uh, are, you, are you not getting itchy feet? Would you, do you not want to go back? I, I do. I, I miss Kenya a lot. I had a lot of really, uh, f- you know, great friends out there. I think that's what was neat about Nairobi too. Is there's there's robust uh, social enterprise um, and social business community of young um, entrepreneurs all doing exciting things from uh, urban slum sanitation to uh, building solar, uh, small-scale solar systems for families. Um, And then I have a, a good friend well, I think you might be interested because uh, I think you, has, you have an automotive uh, background or some experience with, with Rolls-Royce. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. He, um, he's a, a British guy who started a car company called Mobius and uh, built it from you know, locally and, and now has been um, distributing and selling these low-cost vehicles that are designed for rural Kenya, so very robust and, and rugged um, cars that um, – I thought was a crazy idea, but he's doing quite well with it because <laughs> transportation is such a challenge there in rural Kenya. And uh, our company, we, Jehudi, we were one of the first to buy one of these Mobius cars, and I was uh, I drove it all over the the country visiting our our clients and visiting our staff is kind of one of my last uh, adventures before uh, before leaving and then really loved um, that opportunity to, to see Kenya and to drive one of these very basic uh, rough and tough vehicles throughout the country. You'll have to hook us up with the guy from Mobius. Sounds yeah, I good. Yeah, he'd be great, uh, a great participant in your program. Definitely. So listen, this brings us on nicely to what's next, Nat, because I said there you had itchy feet and you can really hear the the love in your in your voice for for, for Kenya and, and Africa where, where are you going to go next good question and I think uh, <laughs> so I, do, I, I don't know the answer I, do you? <laughs> I have some ideas but I, I think you know I, I never anticipated being out in Kenya for six years I thought eight months was going to be a long time so it was uh, <laughs> definitely something that, that I didn't expect but 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 absolutely fell in love with the, the country and the work. And, um, you know, currently I'm in, uh, in Denver right now and, and um, back and taking some uh, classes and still advising a few companies uh, in Kenya and uh, in East Africa. But really love working with entrepreneurs. And I think it's going to be tough for me to then go and work in a formal <laughs> workplace in a, in a job with a boss and um, not be able to uh, call my own shots and create my, my culture. So I think um, I, I definitely believe I'll be headed back to either start uh, a new company or work to advise and continue to work with other uh, entrepreneurs as they go through their struggle. So uh, I imagine that I'll find my way back to East Africa in the, in the coming years. 
the downloads for, for this show go all over the world, Nat, so you never know. Something might come up. With <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> but I, I think really... It's a social enterprise, social business that really where your heart is, you know, you've left a great legacy behind. And I think innovation and, and changing people's lives is, is probably something you're really passionate about. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Uh, it, it, it is. And I think that's that's what's exciting is, is just the number of ideas that are out there. And there's not a, a lack of ideas. It's more just the ability to find the financing and to execute and to scale. I think that's um, a little bit in, in need. But um, that is certainly where, where I hope I can uh, help the help the industry. So Nat, before you go, is there any books, any suggestions of books you could leave us with? Obviously, you're an author yourself, but is there anyone that you particularly like to read off? Absolutely. There's there's a couple that I really felt uh, helpful, and, and your other um, uh, your other speakers have certainly given a, a great list, so I won't repeat any of those. But the one I, I enjoyed was The Hard Things About Hard Things by Ben uh, Horowitz. It was just talking about that that struggle and starting the the business and some of the drama that he had to go through with a publicly traded company um, during the dot com uh, <laughs> bust. So that was uh, I think really helpful at the time of the challenges that I was facing reading um, uh, his story and uh, also delivering happiness, uh, which is the Zappos uh, online shoe company story and and just the how I, I, a culture can be set up with a company and how powerful that uh, that culture can be in terms of delivering uh, performance. Well, I'll have to take a look at those. So not when you were um, overseas, did you find yourself reading a lot, missing home and just picking up a book? And I do, yeah. And I, I do a lot of audiobooks. I, I love that when I go running or um, go driving. And um, actually, the book that I read that helped me write my book, um, it doesn't have a great title, but it's called uh, Book Launch. And, and I did that as I was on my... Um, tour with mobius um so that was another another good one that's a nice tip because i'm sure there's there's a book and a few people we've spoken to and a few people listening out there so what was that one book launch is book launch and the author is uh chandler bolt right fantastic so now just before we leave um do you want to let us know um where we can find you because i'm sure we've got we've got listeners who will be very interested in this we've got listeners involved in social enterprises and are facing some of the challenges that you may have faced. You know, wh- where can we find you? Absolutely, and I, I'm very open to, to helping others, and I think that's um, something that's unique or perhaps not too unique, but that's something that I think that's special about the social impact and on social entrepreneurship sectors is that there is a very good support group and, um, and community out there. So I'm happy to, to help uh, anyone out there to avoid some of the challenges that I have had to go through. Um, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. I think I'm pretty easy to find. I think that's how you found me. Um, as well, I have a website, uh, nat-robinson.com. So either, either of those. So I'm happy to um, to be in touch with any of your, your listeners. And in terms of the book, Nat, is there a link from your website to the, to the book? There is a link to the book. Yep. You can also find the book on uh, Amazon. If you Google uh, creating a cash cow in Kenya, it should, uh, it should come up. Excellent. That's fantastic. Well, I need to read this book now. So you need to send me one. Oh, good. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was fun to write. Really uh, enjoyed it. And there's a lot of, uh, said even some fun stories out there for people who aren't, um, who, who maybe get a little bored with the, the business uh, story about uh, racing camels and uh, staying in castles on the, on the beach and um, all the rest of the excitement of taking safaris and camping with lions out in, in Kenya, but also um, spending time with, um, with our rural farmers. I think I, I covered a lot of those in the book. And being chased by a rhino? Being chased by a rhino and it's uh, <laughs> it's it's baby that was terrifying. That was <laughs> and I just remember rolling up the window as it was coming at me, as if that was going to uh, prevent the <laughs> that was going to save me. <laughs> it wasn't in the Mobius, was it? No, no, thank God it wasn't in the Mobius. <laughs> we'd, we'd have been in more trouble. It wasn't wasn't much better. It was in a little Rav Four, so uh, the rhino was still oh, wow. bigger than the, the vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> That would have been a good marketing advert for yeah. Toyota. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right now, well, listen, thanks for being a star. And um, I really appreciate your time. Like you say, I know you've, you've got a bit of time difference there. So you've been great. And thanks very much, Nat. Oh, it's my pri- uh, privilege. I, I really appreciate being on the show. Thank you so much, Ian. Cheers, Nat. Well, that was Nat Robinson. I hope you enjoyed that. I was really pleased to get Nat on the show. Nat's got a seven-hour time difference being over in Denver there. I was pleased because of the work that Dinah's completed, Dinah from episode one, and the feedback that you gave me in terms of some of the stories that, that she that she gave us. So I knew that um, Nat would give us something similar in terms of the work he's done in Kenya. No doubt you're going to jump onto Amazon and buy his book now. If you do, let us know your feedback. 
And um, we've also got industryangel.com, the Facebook page, and there's a LinkedIn group as well. So please keep in touch. I've been Ian Farrer. This is the Industry Angel. Thanks for listening.